Recording in progress. No, no hay sonido, Ale. Compartir sonido. Y bancos. Como una minera puede ser percibida desde un extremo a otro. Welcome everybody. Tú tienes la mente de un comunicador. Quieres trascender y transformar. Quieres ir más. Hola, ¿te has dado cuenta cómo las organizaciones tienen como una personalidad? Como de bancos y bancos. Como una minera puede ser percibida desde un extremo a otro. ¿Y por qué hasta una empresa de telecomunicaciones debe cuidar su propia comunicación no solo con sus clientes, sino con sus empleados, partners, proveedores y la sociedad? Todas esas percepciones construyen la imagen de las organizaciones y si pensabas que una buena imagen es solo cuestión de pasar más tiempo frente al espejo, tienes que conocer de qué se trata la carrera de comunicación e imagen empresarial. Porque detrás de la imagen de una organización, empresa o institución, está el especialista en comunicación e imagen empresarial. Este profesional es quizá el más versátil que puedes encontrar. Dentro de una organización, es posible que te encuentres con más de uno, como en el área de comunicación interna, comunicación externa, imagen institucional, recursos humanos, relaciones comunitarias, responsabilidad social, sostenibilidad e inclusión, gestión de crisis, entre otros. Por ejemplo, Mario, como gerente de comunicación interna, gestiona iniciativas para que los trabajadores de todas las sedes regionales se sientan identificados con la cultura y valores de la organización. En sus viajes, a veces coincide con Paula, la jefa de Relaciones Comunitarias. Paula dirige todos los esfuerzos para estrechar los lazos sociales en donde la empresa opera, pues sabe que una empresa del siglo XXI es más que resultados financieros. Jorge empezó como Community Manager y hoy lidera el team digital encargado de administrar los proyectos de transformación digital en la empresa. Jorge trabaja en estrecha colaboración con Cintia en el departamento de marketing para elaborar estrategias que conecten no solo funcionalmente, sino a nivel emocional con los clientes de la empresa. Y Cintia contrata los servicios externos de Daniel, consultor en gestión de la imagen y reputación, un especialista en identificar cómo la organización es percibida por sus diferentes públicos, ¿Qué tienen en común todas estas personas? Son profesionales de la carrera de comunicación e imagen empresarial de la UPC, con una malla curricular sumamente variada. Desde el primer día de clases, ellos tuvieron contacto con el mundo de las comunicaciones, con el mundo real, tanto en el interior de nuestro país como en el extranjero, a través del programa de intercambio con más de 30 universidades alrededor del mundo. Comunicación e imagen empresarial es una carrera apasionante que nunca se queda quieta, así que si te apasionan las comunicaciones, si te gusta reinventarte y ampliar tus horizontes con una carrera muy dinámica que te pueda llevar a cualquier parte del mundo, decídete por la carrera de comunicación e imagen empresarial, solo en UPC. Elizabeth. 
Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a este evento de Image Week, World After COVID, Historical Analysis of How the World Copes with the Post-Pandemic Life. Mi nombre es Elizabeth Ontaneda, soy docente de la carrera y tengo el agrado de ser su anfitriona hoy día. Al ser un evento bilingüe, voy a hacer una breve presentación del evento en inglés. Antes de presentar a nuestro expositor y invitado y su charla, primero en español y luego en inglés. Good afternoon and welcome to this Image Week event, World After COVID, Historical Analysis of How the World Copes with Post-Pandemic Life. My name is Elizabeth Antonetta. I'm an instructor in the program and I'll be glad to be your host for today's event. As a bilingual event, I'm going to present the speaker and a summary of his presentation today, first in Spanish, then in English. And at the end of the event, I'd also be glad to translate questions and answers. Daniel J.R. Gray is director de historia y docente principal en la Universidad de Hertfordshire, Reino Unido. Su investigación se enfoca en la intersección entre el género, la ley y medicina, especialmente en relación a los crímenes de violencia y género en Gran Bretaña y su imperio durante los siglos XIX y XX. Actualmente edita un número especial de la revista Historia Crítica con el Aiza Teixeira de Toledo sobre historias de violencia sexual y de género que será publicado en noviembre de 2022. Las pandemias y plagas han tenido consecuencias profundas para la sociedad humana y su desarrollo, y como COVID-19 nos ha mostrado de manera gráfica, el siglo XXI no es excepción. Estos momentos y sus secuelas pueden generar cambios intensos en lo político, social, cultural y económico. Esto también se podría percibir como marcar una ruptura significativa de las décadas anteriores por las personas que viven a través de ella. Comparar respuestas contemporáneas a COVID con precedentes como la pandemia de influenza de 1918, esta charla sitúa estas preocupaciones en el siglo XXI en el contexto más amplio del siglo XX amplio y cuestiona si realmente debe, se debe ver como un marcador de cambio o un límite entre el mundo antes y después del COVID. Daniel J.R. Gray is Head of History and Principal Lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire, UK. His research focuses on the intersection between gender, law, and medicine, particularly in relation to crimes of violence in Britain and its empire during the 19th and 20th centuries. He's currently editing a special issue on the journal Historia Critica with Eliza Teixeira de Toledo on histories of sexual and gender violence that will be published in November 2022. Pandemics and plagues have profound consequences for human society and its development. And as COVID-19 has graphically demonstrated, the 21st century is no exception. Such moments and their aftermath can generate intense political, social, cultural, and economic change. They may also be perceived as marking a significant rupture from preceding decades by the people who lived through them. Comparing contemporary responses to COVID with precedents such as the 1918 influenza pandemic, this talk situates these 21st century concerns in the broader context of the long 20th century and questions whether it should indeed be seen as a permanent break or boundary between the world before and after COVID. Sin más, les dejo con el Dr. Gray. Thank you, Dr. Gray. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And two important starting points for this. First of all, I do have some images. Really importantly, both for your peace of mind and ethically as historians, they are not of ill people or let alone anything else. So I thought that was really important, particularly when I'm talking about, in some cases, um, diseases which cause potentially not only death, but permanent and profound disfigurement. So I didn't think it was, it was appropriate to, to show those. I would for my own students in a class briefly, but I didn't think it was okay for a public talk. Um, the other thing is, it's not that I'm expecting a call, but like all middle-aged white men, I love the sound of my own voice. And so in order to keep to time, I want to make sure that I keep an eye on my clock. Nothing worse than particularly a teacher who just... So, so in an excellent article uh, for the journal Historical Social Research in 2021, uh, the co-authors Martin Gorski, Bernard Harris, Patricia Marsh and Ida Milne, who you may have come across before for their work on histories of plagues and pandemics, um, Dr. Milne, for example, she's uh, arguably Ireland's foremost expert on the impact of 1918 in Ireland, um, wrote together an article which was designed to think about the benefits and the challenges and also the limits of comparing past and present pandemics. 
Um, and the too long didn't read version of the article, if we condense it down, is it's really valuable if you're careful. <laughs> um, so they, they very specifically compared the impact of the 1918 influenza epidemic um, in their article in Britain and Ireland specifically, uh, and then also COVID, looking very carefully at the data sets, um, but reminding us that all pandemics are of their time and almost all people who live through them think that nothing like this has happened before. Even if they know that the same disease has, has hit, maybe even in their region, they think of it as being unique to them. And I think that's really important to think about it. Um, and arguably that's precisely why those comparisons are so valuable is because they are so historically and regionally specific. Um, so in my talk today, and bearing in mind the variety of plagues and pandemics throughout history and throughout the world, as a historian who usually works on Britain and India, I'm afraid that's where I've stuck, um, but I hope you will find it interesting. And I want to sketch out the broader context of these responses in the late 19th and through to the early 21st century. And the, it help us think about the extent to whether, um, as I said, there is a permanent break between pre and post pandemic world, or whether we maybe want to think of it as being a, a wheel that turns and turns to the same place again. Um, so pandemics and plagues, of course, are often associated in the popular imagination. I don't know if this is so much the case of post 2020, but before this, if I was teaching in the early 2000s and I said to my students, think of a pandemic, I don't know, where do you guys go first if you think about a plague or a pandemic? Black, Black death, absolutely. Everyone goes medieval. Everyone goes medieval. I think this must drive, I'm not a medievalist, I work on very late stuff, but if I was a medievalist, this would drive me nuts. What do you associate it with? Mm, kings and rats. Everyone goes to the Black Death. That's a really logical one, absolutely. But they've been just as much a feature of later modernity as the medieval period or early modernity. Um, and for reasons of time and space, I've needed to focus on a few in particular. Oops. Cool. So I'm going to think about late 19th and early 20th century smallpox, which was also why I wanted to emphasize there will not be pictures of that. Um, the 1918 influenza pandemic, and then finally thinking about COVID-19. And I'm gonna focus particularly on Britain for the first two um, as well, and then switch to thinking about India and the implications of COVID-19 there in particular. Um, so arguably at the turn of the 20th century, so, this is not from the late 19th century. Those of you who are used to seeing early 19th or late 18th century art or satirical cartoons will be aware that this is from very, very early on. This, this print is from 1802. And it's a cartoon satirizing the dangers of vaccination. So as you can see, or you might be able to see, um, it's got uh, a doctor with devil horns and a tail, no cloven hooves but a devil horns and a tail, um, pouring a load of screaming babies into the mouth of a monster with sores called vaccination. And there's all sorts of other diseases here as well. So there's pestilence, plague, uh, fetid ulcers, leprosy. And for those of you with a classical background, Pandora's box, so the woman who ended up releasing all the evils into the world. And... Uh, here you see the babies coming out the other end and then being stoked into, into fire. So it's a very biting satire. So also a useful reminder that, that um, rightly or wrongly, um, and I don't want to get into the debates about that, that concerns or fears about vaccination have always also been a feature um, as, for as long as it's been around. So arguably at the turn of the 20th century, the disease most associated in both Britain and India with the sorts of concerns and debates we might associate with COVID was smallpox. So this had been a source of absolute terror from the ancient world right through um, arguably to its elimination, uh, which was really, really late. Anyone know when smallpox was eliminated? 1980, 
really, really recent for a historian. That's really, really recent. Um, so people were still getting vaccinations well into the 20th century. Um, and variola major was a cause of was a, a cause of major concern right around the world. Um, it was common in every part of the world. So every single country on the planet, every single time period, developed particular means or concerns about how it was, should be prevented, how it should be controlled, and what you did. And in most cases, right the way through this period, luck plays a major, major, major role because the ability to treat it is incredibly limited. Um, and that continues right the way through into the, into the 20th century. Um, it also seems to have mutated in the 17th century. So at some point in the early modern period, it became, it was already horrible and it becomes, this is obviously a scientific term, it becomes a lot more horrible around about the 1600s. It becomes a lot more virulent and it's already something that you can almost not escape. So uh, Henry Mayer has pointed out, so this is raising a really high bar. You've got a horrible condition that's really dangerous and it just gets worse. Um, so, sorry, not a lot of historians are optimists. <laughs> chicken or egg thing about whether we start like that or whether we become like that. But this sort of thing is why. Um, so Henry Mayer has noted that smallpox marked the lives, both metaphorically and literally, of everyone who lived in early modern London, which was arguably the world's biggest uh, city at the time. Uh, people of all ages that hadn't contracted the disease were scared of it. Not a lot of those, or at least not for long. Um, those that survived it almost certainly had some sort of permanent disfigurement or injury as a result. That might be very mild. You might be lucky or you might not be. And since the disease accounted for almost one in 10 burials throughout the late 17th and early 20th century, everybody would have known someone who died of it. You cannot escape it. So sufferers of all ages might be left with terrible scarring. Um, it might leave you with blindness, with limb deformities, um, increased susceptibility to a whole host of other conditions, um, which are also very serious, notably tuberculosis, of course, which was incurable until the 20th century. Um, and the so-called pock marks, the marks that were left on the skin, even from a very mild case, um, were so common that both popular and official sources that might describe someone, so medical records or poor law records, um, they remained a feature well into the 19th century of a standard description, as you mentioned, where their marks are or where their scars are. Um, people wrote uh, pamphlets or books on how you cope after you've been left horrendously disfigured by smallpox. How do you try and get your self-esteem back? Um, <laughs> You know, what happens when you're no longer able to get married because your face is covered in scars? You know, all these, all these things, which, and I am making a joke about this. I don't mean to make light of it. Um, but these are really, really profound things. And this is without even, of course, taking into serious account what we would consider, and I recognize the term as anachronistic, the profound psychological damage or trauma that must have been, been encountered through living through that, through watching other people go through it. Um, and even if their own bout of the disease is relatively mild, the concerns they would have. So unsurprisingly then, by the time you get to the 19th century, it's an aspect of central concern for fledgling public health systems in both Britain and in India. Um, India, actually, the Hindu pantheon has a goddess devoted entirely to epidemic diseases called Chitala, um, one, of, um, one of whose concerns is smallpox. Um, and it's notable that in um, places like Bengal in particular, where Attitudes to religion can be more syncretic, although I don't want to either get into the suggestion that, that Bengal is somehow culturally superior to everywhere else in India, or that there's a magical, happy, uh, multicultural uh, experience going on necessarily. Uh, lots of Muslim families will participate in festivals to Shitala, or at least used to in the 19th century, because you do not want to cross her, right? She's turning up at your house with smallpox. I too would think, mm, yeah, I might do this on the way to the mosque. <laughs> you know? um, so with this in mind, it's a major, major concern. And despite the suspicion, which initially um, in, is encountered by inoculation, inoculation is giving someone a very mild form of the disease. Usually you get a straw and basically you blow a piece of smallpox 
up the, the, the person's nose and they end up with a very mild version of it. Initially, in the early 18th century, people are really worried about that. They think it's really dodgy. Uh, they associate it with um, Asia. Turkey is the only European country where it's standard. Um, and so it's, and, and basically, for reasons that I won't bore you with, British doctors are very suspicious of this weird sounding practice. I don't really understand it. Why would we do that? This is what foreigners do. Um, but by the turn of the 19th century, it's become an established practice. It's gone from being this controversial, weird and creepy treatment where they think lots of people die from it to working class families, it's standard. You try and, you try and get control of it. Around the same time, you have Edward Jenner developing a new process called vaccination, which is very quickly taking over in terms of it. So it's not that people don't think that smallpox should be controlled or they don't think there aren't measures to do it, but why would you want to try out this weird new experimental process? We've got the inoculation stuff, that's fine. Why would you want to try the other thing? Um, and doctors in the 1820s and 30s really take to vaccination as an alternative very, very quickly. They become really popular. As you can see, it's not universally popular and people are very scared of it. Um, it's also important to bear in mind that um, there's debates, including amongst a minority of physicians. So again, you might be thinking of, of, of parallels with COVID-19. A small number of doctors think, say, no, 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 this is weird and dangerous. We don't want to do take it up, even if mainstream medical opinion by the 1830s is saying, no, we definitely, we need to make sure everyone does this. Um, and there's this debate that goes on and there's an increasingly tough series of legislation and other measures designed to coerce parents who, who are scared about vaccination to get their children vaccinated in the 1860s and 70s. And it's a minority, but it's a very powerful minority. It forges a sort of cross-class resistance movement. Nadia Durbach has written a very wonderful book about this, about it remaining a sort of cross-class um, movement of sympathy against vaccination right into the early 20th century in Britain. Um, because it's neither painless, nor, it, as she's put it, is it was it a minor intervention. The lancet, the, the little knife, it's like a little knife that you use. You end up doing a crisscross pattern into the skin, and then you scoop out some infected smallpox matter from the unfortunate person, and then you lay it on. Now, if anyone has taken small children for vaccinations now, it's really traumatic. <laughs> it's really traumatic, even with a little needle, and you know it's going to be over quickly. Not surprisingly, they normally get very distressed. It is very, very distressing watching your child be in pain and in distress. And this is... <laughs> Not surprisingly, um, people think it is really dangerous. And this is the other flip side. It is in this period. Um, a doctor who tries to, there's a, there's, a, there's a very widespread belief that syphilis is being passed on to babies through that because they've used infected matter from someone with syphilis. Um, and one doctor who says this is nonsense, this is because poor people don't understand how this works. I'm going to do this. Would you like to guess what he does? He infects himself with syphilis by accident in 1881, which is an even stronger advocate for this is dangerous. See, this is dangerous. On the other hand, it also looks, it also looks like it's the cause of all sorts of anything your child gets afterwards. Why would you not think that vaccination has made that happen? They were fine. Then they had this creepy process and now they're sick with something else. They've never recovered. So there's all sorts of fears about this. Um, and in fact, in 1889, there's a Royal Commission appointed to look into the dangers of vaccination because so many parents are refusing to do it. They say it's so dangerous. Um, and it takes seven years to get the amount of evidence together. They're hearing witness testimony for seven years about this. And they do agree in the end that mandatory vaccination should stay, but they want to give people much more ability to opt out. They also um, say that it's important not to keep prosecuting parents who refuse to, to vaccinate their children because all it's doing is getting bad publicity for the whole process. Um, and they also say, which is important, is that 
they say you need to stick from now on to using a process, a technological process with glycerinated calf lymph. So getting um, uh, lymph, lymph material related to smallpox from uh, basically cows. Um, not surprising, this, is, this also leads to all sorts of debates in India, where for Hindus, the cow is a, is a holy animal, about the extent to which it's um, forbidden or allowable um, under their religion. Um, but glycerination is also important because that process, Peter Baldwin's pointed out, that process of technology actually kills off other bacteria that might be, that might be growing or around. So it actually made the whole process much safer. Um, parents are still concerned about it and still able to file a conscientious objection. There's also a lawyers love debates, right? So do judges and case law is important. So debates over what does it actually mean? The law, new law says conscientious objectors are allowed to say, I don't want my child vaccinated because I believe it's wrong or dangerous. Well, what does that actually mean? Who gets to be a conscientious objector? So some magistrates said things like mothers can't be conscientious objectors, only fathers can. And there are various complaints, cases, controversies about this until 1907, where basically they settle on the wording and say, nope, if this happens, you can be a conscientious objector, and that's fine. Um, this, in parallel, uh, the last significant outbreak of variola major, so smallpox is most dangerous form. And when I say most dangerous forms, without wishing to get graphic, if you have a really bad case, your skin peels off in sheets. Um, not surprising that one kills you. Um, the last major outbreak is 1903. Smallpox remains in the UK until the 1930s, but it's variola minor, which is a much, much less serious version of the disease. Um, so it's increasingly seen, although vaccination rates are dropping, it's increasingly seen as more like, say, measles or chickenpox, or potentially maybe mild flu. It's increasingly seen by parents, particularly ones who are scared of it, as um, a sort of minor inconvenience rather than my child will die if I don't get them vaccinated. So it's an interesting um, and unusual example of a campaign in which compulsory vaccination for children was abolished. Introduced first in 1853, increasingly resisted in the 1860s and 70s, gone by 1907. Now, even if the legislation compelling you officially remained on the statute books until 1946, when the National Health Service was introduced in the UK, but in practice, it's dead from 1907. And this actually had a really interesting and, and profound impact on other public health campaigns in Britain. It makes it really, really important to avoid the appearance of compulsion because doctors just point to the smallpox vaccination campaign and say, look, 40 years, 50 years of arguments and laws and problems, we want this to work. Um, Gareth Millward has pointed out that um, other, other forms of vaccination very deliberately didn't take the same coercive view uh, in Britain. So by the 1920s, the medical profession increasingly sees smallpox as a sort of frustrating outlier in terms of its treatment and prevention. Um, uh, Millwood's evocatively described it as, quote, a product of a bygone age rather than the new era of bacteriology and virology. So it stands as an exemplar of what you shouldn't do if you want health programs to work. And doctors by the 1920s are saying, actually, it looks really different. It's much more invasive. The crisscross pattern of smallpox scarring was still going on right up until the 60s and 70s. So that, and that's the technology developed in the 1790s. So it, it really looks like a major outlier, um, especially at the same time as smallpox is increasingly associated in very problematic, not to say outright racist ways with uh, developing countries. So India has a couple of major outbreaks um, in the 70s, for example. There's a major outbreak in 1974 in particularly East India. Um, and it's, but it's associated in very problematic ways. As it's no longer a rich country's problem. So some of the messaging about it becomes particularly problematic. Um, tellingly, uh, vaccination programs for other conditions like diphtheria, they very deliberately avoid this. 
So smallpox, round about the start of the First World War, has moved from being this terrifying thing which kills everybody. Um, having a successful vaccination campaign that they've had to roll back on, but also is becoming less and less scary as, as a disease, as something that's seen as something hiding around every corner. Now, so-called Spanish flu, speaking of racist messaging, um, why is it called Spanish flu? Because British people love to blame things on foreigners. It's one of our wonderful continuities dating back to the early modern world. And um, there was a very, very obvious and sad conclusion, which is when Spanish doctors and nurses diagnosed the first cases in Spain, the papers and indeed the, the British medical authorities just immediately go, all right, Spanish flu then. Now, influenza is obviously everywhere and influenza kills people. It even kills people today. Um, it was an avian flu virus that much was established in, in the 1930s and it's still difficult to determine where it first originated. Um, obviously that sort of racist messaging is, is um, whether unwitting or explicit and intentional, is not confined to 1918. Witness the eight, 1957 so-called Asian flu epidemic, which also killed many hundreds of people, or the appalling abuse that East Asian people have suffered, particularly in uh, Britain and the United States in the wake of coronavirus. Um, so again, the more things change, the more things stay the same, right? Um, the 1989 pandemic uh, is estimated to have infected one third of the entire global population at the time. It killed around 50 million people. The CDC, the American CDC, still describes it as the most severe pandemic in recent history. Um, so particularly shocking for observers was the high mortality rate in previously healthy people, again, not to overlabor it, but a strong parallel with COVID. Big difference with COVID is that um, young children are particularly vulnerable. Um, whereas, of course, with COVID, it tends to be older adults. But with the 1918 epidemic, um, my own uh, grandmother actually lost, lost a younger brother during it, um, was that it tended to hit both healthy adults and it could strike with incredible suddenness. Some people described there's an anecdote about one woman stopping her doctor in the street and dying as she talked to him, having looked apparently healthy. Um, it was particularly dangerous because um, the first wave of this appeared in Britain in that May 1918. So it started in Glasgow, where it particularly hit a group of women factory workers, young women factory workers, but initially seemed to disappear again. Um, and then it violently resurged. So as with most viruses, it Cases dropped during the summer, and then it resurged violently in October 1918. Um, and it affected all areas of the country. There's a third, more moderate outbreak in, in spring of 1919, but the, the October one is, is incredibly virulent. It's suddenly everywhere. It's inescapable across Britain and Ireland. And although the fact that it appeared towards the end of the First World War can't have helped anything to do with infrastructure, coordinated responses or public health campaigns, the rapidity of its spread and severity was not immediately obvious and not the most, and, and that's probably the most significant factor. Initially, both the medical profession and the British media downplayed its significance, arguing that this is wartime, you need to just get on with things, we've got other problems, um, and noting that annual outbreaks of influenza are routine. They're not pleasant, people die from it, it's scary, Anyone who's had flu, even now, and, and recovers quickly, quite often people say, I felt like I was dying. I certainly did when I had it the one time I had, but I was a very melodramatic 17-year-old. So <laughs> I don't really think that's data. That's more an anecdote. Um, but because of this, the argument was made for the first ep epidemic that it was, it was not really something to be concerned about. All these whiners making a big fuss. You just need to get on with it. And it, it takes a while to become clear uh, that, that it's going to be more than that, that it's going to be much more severe, um, especially because lots of medical and nursing personnel, of course, are initially still at the front or helping out in the war when that happens. There's also no coordination in the same way before there is after the Second World War in Britain for health responses. So each municipality isn't quite the right word, but it's the closest parallel I can think of, basically decides to do what it wants. 
it doesn't become what's called a notifiable disease, one where um, you're required to not only alert the authorities, but take particular measures to stop it until the spring 1919 outbreak, which we now know was the, the last major one of it. Um, at the time, they probably just thought was the next stage. Um, by that time, it's already happened twice. Um, and so familiar to us all in now in a way that probably wouldn't have been before 2020, there was an emphasis on ventilation and avoiding contact with the, the infected, but also familiar, so too was wildly varying reports and advice, some of which was useless, some of which might prove actively harmful to sufferers. Um, whiskey was prescribed as one remedy, potentially, so it wasn't all bad. Um, and unlike France or the United States at the time, so this is actually an image from, a, uh, from of New York. This is not a British image. This is an image of, of the measures in New York. Um, there wasn't a mandate for mask wearing in the UK. There wasn't mass closures or restrictions on travel in the same way. Um, churches, schools and factories all remained open in Britain unless there was, a, there was such a pressing concern that you needed to shut things down. Um, and it wasn't until the summer of 1919, so when the third outbreak is finally going, although the pandemic itself doesn't stop until 1920 in fall, um, that people start to complain and say, why, hasn't, why haven't we in Britain taken more decisive action? Why, hasn't, why haven't things changed more? Ida Milne has noted that, for example, the British uh, colonial regime's, shall we say, rather chaotic approach to dealing with it in Ireland was actually a major boost for the nationalist movement, a really good example um, for Irish nationalists of, of why you needed to be freed from British rule. Um, and that it brings together um, plans for a Ministry of Health, which was established in the UK in 1919, get moved forward. But it's really, really difficult to untangle what the more immediate impact of that was. Um, it was part of a range of health measures. And also, which I think is important, significantly until very recently, particularly prompted by COVID, despite its monumental impact worldwide, at least in the West, people have suggested that in, in uh, East and South Asia, it's been better remembered. Most European and uh, at least North American people have not really been aware of or remembered the 1918 epidemic. It's vanished from popular memory until very recently. Um, and there are different reasons for that that have been suggested, including the difficulty of working out and picking the threads to say what, what was a plan that was already in place before the Great War and just moving things forward, what's completely unrelated to it, what is related to the First World War and its impact, but actually nothing to do with the pandemic. It's very, very difficult to tease those apart. But also, and I think this is probably going to strike home, the, one of the suggestions is a desperate urge to get back to normality after watching for a couple of years, mass death, mass illness, trauma, and just a desire to put it all behind you on a global level. So, finally, and I am conscious of time, so I will try and keep this short. I want to think about the impact of COVID-19 in India. Now, despite the stringent lockdown, which was imposed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on the 24th of March 2020, which gave just four hours warning that the entire population of 1.3 billion citizens from midnight would be forbidden from leaving their homes for the next 21 days, um, and that uh, July 2020 was heralded by the Indian media and authorities as marking Unlock 2.0, which was the removal of many coronavirus measures in India. Um, it continued to spread rapidly. It became a, a hotspot region. Uh, by the 6th of July, um, 613 people, on the 6th of July 2020 alone, 613 people died from COVID and 25,000 new cases were reported. That's one day in 2020. The following week, India became the third worst affected country by coronavirus in the world. The government uh, assumed that they would identify many more cases due to a rapidly expanded um, test and trace program, particularly in Delhi. Um, and in Delhi, the authorities set up what was es is still estimated to be the world's largest field hospital site. Um, it was an amazing, amazing space, massive tents, um, huge amount of staff 
uh, working there. However, because the government had argued that they were absolutely beating um, COVID, stark parallels with the British government's approach here, um, this was not a popular set of statistics. So the official statistics for India at the same time, the official death rate simultaneously was extremely low. It was estimated at 11 million, considerably smaller than would have been estimated, expected for a population of that size with that degree of disease prevalence. Um, and given the extreme difficulty involved for any medic in diagnosing or confirming that a patient had died from COVID rather than uh, her patient might have died from something related, that's almost certainly a further underestimate. So it's playing with figures and it's difficult to tell um, where this is. So the, the health ministry was proclaiming in the summer of 2020, not only that it had one of the lowest such rates, they argued very forcefully that it had the lowest rate of COVID-19 deaths worldwide. And so receiving a new set of data which contradicted this is unlikely to have been viewed with any enthusiasm. This is further complicated by a paradoxical position facing public health workers in India. So on the one hand, medicine and technology have huge status, they're massively important. And on the other, um, the public health system has been grossly under-resourced since at least the 1970s. And arguably that's a continuity of British colonial rule um, where resources were often very low put into as well. Um, only the most poor and the most desperate people do not use private medicine in India. Pharmacists are in practice often willing to sell medicine or other drugs in as small quantities as a single dose. Um, and as the eminent medical historian Sarah Hodges has argued, um, who is a historian of, of Indian medicine in, since the 1980s in particular, um, it's corporate healthcare rather than state healthcare which is seen as part of India's golden story of transformation to being a world leader in biotechnology. Um, and this is really, really important. So a company like the Chennai-based um, Apollo Hospital Enterprise Limited are held up as these exemplars, which everywhere should follow because they're part of India's sunshine story since the 1980s. Um, and so one, that's one important factor. The other one is the opportunity this has given for um, the Bharataya Janata Party, the BJP, um, which is the, the, the party of Modi's government, to use coronavirus restrictions as a way to crack down on dissent or criticism. And just very briefly, one example I would like to use, I'll skip over one of the others, is uh, dealing with the feminist activist group Pindra Top, Break the Cage, where uh, two women who led that, it's a student activist organization, Devana Kalita and Natasha Nawal prompts really grave concerns because it seems a really frightening exemplar. So both are graduate students at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi and leading members of Pindra Todd Break the Cage. And they were first arrested on the 23rd of May 2020 in relation to a sit-in protest that February against the new Citizenship Amendment Act, which was one passed the previous December. And it very specifically laid down that migrants who were Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, or Parsis, and who'd fled religious persecution in neighboring countries, um, could be fast-tracked for citizenship. Which group is not there, accounting for one in five of India's population, Muslims? It's very specifically um, anti-Muslim in, in some of it. It's, it's particularly um, troubling when considered in conjunction with methods such as the uh, National Register of Citizens, which has been kept in Assam in Northeast India. Lots of people from Assam are often criticized or it's racist messaging, but they, they are often suggested to not be properly Indian in the same way. Um, Pindra Todd's sit-in was one of many protests against this. Um, there was one, uh, the Shaheen Bagh sit-in led by Muslim women got 100,000 protesters in Delhi. However, Pindra Todd was noticed in the media as being a major vocal critic to young bright women who are very, very obviously the face of anti-government criticism. Um, and they'd already successfully protested misogynistic regulations at student hostels in Delhi for the university. They were arrested and charged by the authorities with a range of alleged offenses related to the sit-in. Uh, the duty magistrate who heard the charges um, ruled that both women had been arrested under Section 186, which is obstructing a public servant, 
However, um, there was nothing which was suggested in the file given by police that the range of other um, offences which were later charged had happened were anything to do with these two women. But uh, almost immediately after being released on bail, Ms. Kalita and Ms. Nawal were then rearrested on separate charges. Murder, attempted murder, rioting and criminal conspiracy for things that had happened during the uh, protests. No further details were released, um, uh, uh, reported in the media, but both women were kept in custody for an additional 14 days. Um, in practice, they were not released on bail for 13 months. When they were released, this was because the Dili High Court specifically made a ruling that there was no obvious evidence of these crimes and that they actually said, you know, you, you, the government appears to be using coronavirus and terrorism legislation together as a way to silence critics and make a public example of don't disagree with us, um, which is very troubling. So such overt and state targeted retribution for dissent has disproportionately followed lines of gender and faith. Hindu and male activists who criticized the Modi regime have indeed been targeted for arrest and detention, but a significant number of those processes have been women of all faiths in India and Muslim campaigners of both sexes, whose criticisms are seen by the BJP as especially galling and intolerable by those in power. Conversely, uh, Kapil Mishra, who was a BJP cabinet minister, whose threatening denunciations of protesters uh, were described by many as inciting the riots that follows or police officers caught on footage assaulting Muslim protesters, were not similarly arrested and charged. So for those citizens old enough to remember the so-called emergencies of the 1970s in Dira Gandhi's period of rule by diktat, this must have created some very unsettling comparisons. Um, so in April 2020, the novelist Arundhati Roe wrote a powerful essay for the Financial Times, which you may have seen on the impact of COVID in India, entitled The Pandemic is a Portal. And in this, Roy argued that the unique circumstances and unprecedented times of COVID-19 offered the nation an invaluable opportunity for radical transformation to either continue to hold on to old possibilities or to remake the world anew. I read this essay with great pleasure when it was first published, rereading it for the eloquence of the prose and inspired by the hopeful message it carried. That was a mistake because on the 23rd of May in her follow-up article, Roy called it, after the lockdown, we need a reckoning, which gives you a hint as to the, the material covered. She emphasized instead <coughs> the profound economic and social damage and the way that India was tackling the virus as heavy handed, especially with criticism. So just very quickly to conclude, the more things change, the more things stay the same. I think we can see definite parallels with each of these pandemics and how it happens. What's particularly noticeable is the tendency for people to assume that the times they live in are like no other, that they are experiencing something unseen in the world and the potential, both good and bad, to try and follow that impulse in either remaking things anew for better or worse. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, nos pones tu cámara. Vamos a ver si tenemos alguna pregunta, creo que sí. Eh, ¿No nos lees, Elizabeth? <coughs> yes, uh, we have, hi Daniel, we have one quest, two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, given that history is circular, as some say, do you think we would be starting a similar process to that of post-1918? That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think, yes, I think we can already see elements of this. I don't want to over argue that it's always the same, but I am a bit of a continuity rather than a change historian. I tend to emphasize the continuity. Um, and that process of forgetting people, I'm sure we've all seen people talking about, we just want to get back to normal. We need to get back to normal. We need to live normal life. And that seems to be a very definite similarity with 1918 as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, los, los aquí también pueden hacer las preguntas en español, chicos, no se preocupen. Elizabeth nos va a ayudar a traducirlo. Uh, Elizabeth, creo que tienes otra más, ¿verdad? I do, just a minute. 
the next question that we had was, can the COVID-19 pandemic be seen as a permanent break or boundary between the world before and after COVID? I would say no. I would say no. And the reason I would say no is despite the very big changes that it's produced and created, I'm very conscious that people keep on assuming with pandemics that, that this is a, a, a clear line before and after. And that isn't to denigrate the individual experiences. For some people, obviously, if you've lost your father, if you've lost family members or friends, of course, it's going to be a permanent marker in that way. But at a broader social level, I think it's a bit like the closest parallel I can have is teaching about the 1960s. So when you teach about the 1960s, particularly for those of us who didn't live through it the first time, there's a tendency for people to imagine it as almost a magic light switch. Everything was very conservative and everyone wore gray. And then a magic light switch went on on the 1st of January, 1960, and everyone wore orange and other bright colors and took lots of drugs and smoke and drank and listened to new music. And then in the 31st of December, 1969, everything went to beige. And then the 70s were different. And actually, the first thing you do if you're teaching students about the history of the 60s is to say, it's more conservative than you think it is. And there's more continuities with the past and with what happens afterwards than you think. It's even if lots of people at the time did believe it was totally new and nothing was like it and the world would never be the same. So perhaps that experience too makes me think, don't think it's going to be, it obviously changes, but not changes forever and always. Let's go. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Tienes alguna otra? Tú, chicos aquí. Okay. Um, is there any chance that the monkeypox that it's been on the news lately could become something as huge as COVID? I and mean, I think right now it's an epidemic. Because yes, thank you. That's a really interesting question. I have been thinking about that the last couple of days, actually, because it seems to be spreading so rapidly and it is causing so much anxiety for particularly, tellingly, um, doctors, um, particularly sexual health doctors, I've noticed, because that's that's one of the main ways that, that that can be transmitted. I think it probably does, just on the basis of how it's less so than COVID because it's not as contagious. Um, it requires close, not necessarily intimate contact, but close contact. But the fact that there's been this explosion in cases, particularly in Europe at the moment and, and increasingly in the UK, does make me think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Those are all our questions we have. Entonces, eh, pasamos a lo siguiente. Vamos a pasar a la encuesta final, por favor, para que puedan eh, llenarla. Y aprovecho para pedirle a Úrsula, que está aquí con nosotros, para que nos dé algunas palabras, porque estamos inaugurando hoy. Úrsula Freón eh, es nuestra decana, es decana de la Facultad de Comunicaciones, y bueno, estamos aquí, este, hay chicos de Historia, hay chicos de Humanidades, hay chicos de la Facultad de Comunicaciones, y nada, Úrsula, tienes que hablar con esto nomás. Agradecerle a Claudia y a todos ustedes, por supuesto, a Daniel, de que han venido desde tan lejos para conversar con nosotros y para intercambiar ideas. Chicos, les agradezco que hayan venido, estas oportunidades son realmente contadas, uno siempre aprende mucho de este tipo de relaciones con gente de fuera, uno nunca sabe en qué momento se nos va a volver a encontrar y va a poder intercambiar ideas. Para mí es un honor que la carrera de comunicación e imagen empresarial se anime gracias a ustedes a hacer estos eventos, porque si algo yo recuerdo de mis épocas universitarias es todo aquello que iba más allá de las clases diarias, es decir, estas cosas que escuchábamos y que creíamos que no, sabía, no servían para salvo de relleno, y al final nos dábamos cuenta que tenían mucho más de utilidad de lo que creíamos. Entonces, Claudia, yo te felicito por la semana WIC, que le cuesta muelas a la pobre Claudia. Después de esto queda como devastada seis meses. Y eso es, este, lo hace por ustedes. Entonces, agradecerles a todos los que nos escuchan, nos ven. Y, por supuesto, seguimos apostando por la, por la mejor carrera de comunicación y más empresarial. Ya depende de ustedes. 
hace unos días recibí una linda noticia de Ariana Basalar, que es una egresada de la carrera de ustedes, que me acaban de contratar en el Banco Mundial, luego de ganarse una beca en, en París, y justo me escribía y me decía que de ella le había servido mucho todo lo que había aprendido en la universidad, no tanto por la universidad en sí, sino por los intercambios y las ideas con Claudia y los alumnos, ¿no? Y estaba fascinada, está en París, le va recontra bien, está súper feliz. Lo primero que hizo fue llamarnos a contarnos que ahora ella era más importante que todos nosotros juntos. No lo dijo así, pero sin duda alguna lo es. Así que muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Katy, thank you for coming. And let's see us tomorrow and maybe in London again. Okay? So, un aplauso para todos. Uh, remember, uh, recuerden por favor que tenemos dos semanas. Today is the first day, so we uh, start with you and uh, the other person. Um, y que estamos comenzando, tenemos mañana a las cuatro y por favor de no dejen de compartir el programa. Esto es un evento abierto, están invitados todos, inviten a sus amigos, inviten a, a sus compañeros, inviten a, a quienes ustedes consideren que es importante. Mañana tenemos comunicación gubernamental, el miércoles género y en la tarde estamos eh, eh, hablando, el eh, jueves estamos hablando de fútbol, también fútbol, fútbol, soccer, games, it's very important, so you know, communication card. Y eh, estamos con una agenda bien, bien recargada y completa. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí, thank you very much again. Gracias. Ana, gracias, gracias a todos. Nos vemos, nos vemos mañana a las 4. Chao, chicos. Gracias, Elizabeth, Rosana, Irene, Alexandra. Gracias, chicos. Muy amable. Recuerden que todo queda grabado en UPC TV. También lo pueden eh, ver nuevamente. Thank you. Sí, vamos a tomarnos una foto, chicos, por favor. Chicos, vamos a tomarnos una foto, por favor. Gracias. Gracias. Ahí adelante. Vamos, chicas, vamos. Un para tomar Vamos a tomar